talk and the theme for this conversation is really breaking down the term of inclusive and what does inclusivity really mean and what do what does the word mean versus what is the intention and how do we really enable the right conversations about that so um, with that said i'm going to pass it to both of you please um, if ever anyone has questions if you want you can write them in the chat, you can email them to me, or alternatively, we will open it up at the end. So whatever forum you feel most comfortable asking that, feel free to do so. Um, so with that said, Aurora, Pamela, over to you. Great, and I just started st sharing my screen. Can folks see it? Yes. Yes. Yep, we got okay. it. Okay, great. Aurora, you wanna well, kick well, off? Yes. So um, first and foremost, Pamela and I couldn't be more uh, grateful at the opportunity to be with you here today. Um, we'd love to invite you all into a quick conversation, um, a brave conversation, because uh, as Alexis shared, um, there may be some buttons that are going to get pushed. And really the intention of that is to just spur um, thinking, spur a little bit of open mindedness and dare I say a little bit of heart opening as well. Um, so today, Pamela and I hope to share sort of two things with you. We're going to share a little bit about our journeys. Go to the next slide. Uh, a little bit about our stories and our journeys. And then we're going to just sort of um, explore, um, explore a little bit of culture, particularly through the dissection of a word um, and lexicon that uh, Pamela and I love sort of having these conversations, not only with our clients, but with ourselves. Like, what do those words, what does that word really mean? And in the context of where we are today, does it actually apply or bring relevance to where we're going? Um, so before we begin and go to that part, I just would like to thank again Alexis and Cassie for inviting us to be here and for all of you uh, allowing this opportunity of brave conversation. I'll start by sharing a little bit about who I am. Um, I am uh, the product of these two wonderful human beings. Uh, my mother on the right is Patricia Petra uh, Gámez Archer. Uh, my mother is a Mexican immigrant. Um, one of the beautiful gifts she gave me was the, was the gift of language. I actually did not learn English until I went to school um, formally. And the gentleman there who um, I love and adore and who I unfortunately lost at the start of this year um, is my father, Hugh Cephas Archer. Uh, my father is an African-American cowboy um, born and raised in Cuero, Texas, and both of my parents were domestics. So I, by, um, by, by proximity and childhood, um, was a domestic. So I spent my entire childhood cleaning and cooking and working in extremely wealthy neighborhoods in San Antonio, Texas, um, not too different than the one I now live in. Um, but you know what I may not have been given in the form of luxuries and uh, material goods, um, I certainly received in the form of some incredible values uh, that quite frankly took a long time for me to circle back to um, in the essence of who I was and in the journey of discovering who I was, particularly as a woman of color in corporate America. So, you know, I spent uh, my summers, my parents as domestics could not afford uh, child care. So I spent my summers in Mexico with my grandmother. My mother comes from a family of 10 brothers and sisters. Um, I spent my summers in Monterrey making tortillas and listening to the music of Jose Jose, Lopita D'Alessio, um, and hanging out with my over 32 cousins during the summer. Um, I equally, uh, once back in Texas, would spend my weekends and particularly Sundays going to Baptist church and making dance moves um, to the tune of Cool and Gang and uh, the Jackson Five. And, um, and then it was very interesting because the backdrop of that was really living in a very white state um, and predominantly being of service 
um, as a domestic to wealthy white people. So I always um, liken that one of my greatest strengths as a marketer came from the fact that I had this tapestry of cultures, of colors, of language, of behavior, of experiences that my childhood gifted me. And I recall a very poignant moment that I think set the backdrop of how I was determined, uh, that sets the cornerstone of who I am as a marketer. My parents at one point worked for a really, really, um, really abusive um, a matriarch of a very wealthy family in Texas, um, who also unfortunately happened to be an alcoholic. And I recall witnessing on a number of occasions just sort of the, um, the impact of her behavior on everyone around her, um, her family, her children, her, her husband, um, and also us as domestics. And the distress and dysfunction that I recall at a very young, early age observing in this woman was actually not that different from the wino that lived at the corner of my neighborhood street. And I remember very distinctly watching the behavior and comparing the two humans that were part of my life and recognizing that they were actually the same. And the thing that distinguished them was that one had additional zeros in their bank account that then propelled a series of human beings around them that actually did the cleanup work to the impact of their behavior while the other did not. But the dysfunction, the emotional stress uh, that they created for their families and anyone around them was actually really similar. And so I took that learning and my keen skill of observing people to truly climb the corporate ladder. Um, I've been fortunate to work uh, predominantly in Fortune 50, uh, if not Fortune 100, uh, starting my career in retail, then working, spending the bulk of it in Silicon Valley, working, leading brands and enterprise level initiatives for organizations such as uh, Hewlett Packard, Xerox, Acer, um, and then did a foray into health working, leading the not only brands, but also then the digital transformation for AstraZeneca, a pharmaceutical company, both at a US level and a global level and then did a stint in publishing and media. And what was very interesting is that during that trajectory, I, um, I checked off the boxes. I checked off the boxes and left behind a lot of who I was to actually fit the contortion and the narrative of what was deemed to be a corporate leader in corporate America, which by all accounts was nothing, absolutely significantly nothing of what I was, um, but was very much the measuring stick by which I was um, performance managed, by which how I was either put on succession plans or not, and how quite frankly, a lot of the ideas and distinct <coughs> in which I solved problems as a change agent and a change maker in most of the organizations that I was hired and asked to lead teams um, was very different than the core and the authentic essence of who I was. But the trade-off at a certain moment in my career allowed me to transcend the socioeconomic reality that I was born into as well as transcend the legacy of a lot of my historical um, reality as well. The historical legacy of poverty, the historical legacy of debt, 
um, and the historical legacy of non-wealth. And so that with that, I'll transition to Pamela. Hi, so um, as Alexa said at the beginning, my name is Pamela Raitt. I am uh, I have the pleasure of being Aurora's partner and co-founder in Bellatrix Group. Um, I have a very different background origin story than Aurora um, as a white woman growing up um, in Washington, D.C. Uh, my entire family is from New York City. Um, both of my grandparents immigrated through New York um, from both Russia and Poland. And uh, my version of the sort of the second generation immigrant story was, you know, constantly being told as a Jewish girl that I, I had to marry a Jewish man and I had to be successful because, uh, you know, of all the struggles that they went through to get to America. Um, but I, I spent my entire life um, in cities. I spent my entire life, I, I started my career in New York after, after graduating from George Washington University. After New York, I moved to San Francisco. I worked in Tokyo and in Hong Kong. I now am in Philadelphia. Um, and I share that because I think um, having that kind of a cosmopolitan upbringing and being on the coasts and being part of a liberal family and being you know, amongst liberal friends, um, I always felt that I was a little more um, I think, you know, the term everyone likes to use nowadays is woke. I always thought that I was a little bit more plugged in maybe to um, caring about what was happening to people who didn't look like me and didn't have the experiences that I had. Um, and I, you know, whether or not that's true and the extent to which that's true is something I've been examining over the last year. We'll talk about that a little in a little more depth in just a minute. Um, but that's my background. And, you know, like Aurora, um, I was lucky to climb the corporate ladder. Um, I worked for, you know, many global agencies over the course of my career in increasingly um, senior roles, you know, ultimately being a, a global executive leader and working with really big, juicy, meaty, um, wonderful clients with big brand names um, and really getting the opportunity um, through that work also to impact um, many different aspects of the marketing and, and agency work that was being done by these clients. Um, you know, YouTube is a great example where I was able to touch not only the YouTube platform, but they actually have a, a sort of behind the scenes piece called Creator Studio where they actually create curriculum for some of their top producing channels. And so I've been really lucky to touch lots of different pieces and parts um, of some of these really big clients. And in 2011, um, I found myself though making a career change um, I came back from San Francisco to Philadelphia, where um, the reality was back in 2011, most of the agencies in the Philadelphia area were in the healthcare space because we've got, you know, the proximity of Princeton here. We've got a lot of pharma in this area. And um, so nine years ago, if you wanted to work at a big agency, you were going to work at Digitas Health. And so that's where I found myself. Um, I had never worked in pharmaceutical advertising before. I didn't know anything about it or understand it. And I was nervous because I had come from this world of working on these big consumer brands. And I was a, you know, I had learned design thinking. I had done, you know, some coursework and gotten certified. And I had all these methodologies that were very human centric and user centric that meant a lot to me as a creative person. And I was lucky enough to um, stumble into having Aurora, as Alexis mentioned, as my client partner. And lo and behold, Aurora was also, I like to say we were um, sort of like refugees into healthcare together. Um, neither of us had come from that world. We had both come from the tech industry in Silicon Valley. We were both design thinkers. We were both consumer centric marketers and, and, at, and felt that that was the right way to make money is that you had to start from caring about people. And so um, over the years, you know, I worked with Aurora as my partner on Circle XR. For those who don't know, Circle XR is a product that 
Um, it's a it's an antipsychotic. It's a it's for folks with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, but really extreme forms of major depressive disorder. And again, Aurora and I felt we didn't want to follow sort of the formulaic way that pharmaceutical advertising had often been done. We wanted to really um, honor and respect the humans who suffered from these conditions, as well as their families and caregivers, as well as the physicians who um, also have a lot of burnout from, you know, dealing with these really challenging conditions. And so um, we had this beautiful partnership for two and a half years. We were able to, you know, the, in 2011, which is the year that our indication for major depressive disorder launched and was the year that Aurora and I had, I think, $26 million worth of media and all sorts of, you know, huge initiatives that we were doing. Um, Circle's revenue was $5.83 billion. And I often looked back over the last nine years, or let's say over the last seven years before we formed uh, Bellatrix two and a half years ago, and I would often say Aurora was the best client I ever had. She was the client who I felt I learned the most from. She was the client who I felt held us to the highest standard of work. And I always felt so proud of, um, you know, $5.83 billion is a pretty good number. And fast forward to 2018, when Aurora and I reconvened, we had both gone, you know, in other directions with our careers in the ensuing, you know, seven years. And we came back together and, and decided that we wanted to form Bellatrix Group. And as Aurora and I started to become closer as partners, um, I learned something that was um, very tragic in my opinion, very painful in my opinion. And also I felt a real loss and shame for um, not only everybody who had worked on our teams, but certainly for AstraZeneca too, Zeneca too. And that is that the reality was, as Aurora was kind of just alluding to during that time period when I was working with her, um, we were probably getting about you know, 20% of who Aurora really was to help us solve problems and think about the type of work that we wanted to put out into the market um, on behalf of, of Circle. Um, Aurora, you know, didn't mention this as much in her, um, her initial yeah. conversation, but um, she served as a caregiver um, to both of her parents, you know, so she served as a caregiver. She's walked into environments with um, her father and seen how her father as a black man was reacted to in healthcare environments. And I guarantee you, it's very different from how I am reacted to or a white man is reacted to. She's experienced navigating healthcare with a parent who doesn't speak English. You know, her mother, um, you know, speaks very broken English and Aurora often has to be her translator. Um, and also for her um, herself, and obviously I'm speaking for her, so I'll let her do that, but her perspective as a woman of color traversing these environments, um, she didn't talk about any of this when we were working on Seracol. She didn't bring any of this beautiful tapestry of experience and reality to the work that we were doing. Aurora, I'll just pause and, and let you add anything that you want to here. Yeah, um, and I think that this is the loss, right? This is the loss because um, when we, when when Pamela and I met, um, I was I was hired into AstraZeneca as a change agent. My job was to literally transform the entire go to market for the brand that at that moment had been stagnant in growth. We put um, a double digit growth trajectory, not only to the top line, but also just uh, for note, this was the highest pro profit uh, creating product in the entire AstraZeneca portfolio at a global level. Um, and while the team saw me as someone that led and drove such a uh, change, within the organization in really pushing the envelope, pushing my executive team. I mean, I literally spent every other week in the CEO's office um, pushing for a different evolution of the model um, for AstraZeneca because what the team didn't know at that time either is that as someone who had recently relocated to Philadelphia with my parents as a caregiver, my father had been recently diagnosed with dementia and he had been put on Seroquel. 
And it was not at all a pleasant experience. But the passion with which I was managing and caring for what was a very traumatic phase for him and us as a family was a part of the empathy and compassion that I brought to how I set the strategy and direction for the brand. But none of that was actually visible to my executive leadership team, to my brand team, and absolutely not to my agency team. Right. <clears throat> so what else did we miss out on <laughs> from the, you know, not having all of Aurora? And, you know, it's funny, Aurora and I have talked about this. And, you know, I'll be honest, at that point in time when I didn't know Aurora as well as I do now, um, I, in my mind, I, I kind of likened her to Claire Huxtable. I thought she was like this, you know, wealthy black woman living in a fancy house and probably married to a, you know, successful black guy. And I, I, I had these, these real um, false um, belief systems about who she was. Um, and as a result of that, um, even our relationship as, as, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to give short trip for our relationship because we did have a wonderful relationship, but there was so much lacking. And for me, as a person who has spent my career on the agency and consultancy side as a creative strategist, um, I often think about, well, what does it take? And I'm sure some of you on this call um, live in this world too. What does it take to reimagine solutions? What does it take to really infuse the work that we do with creativity and imagination? And what are some of the things that make working in an agency environment so fun and so special and so unique? Um, it's things like intimacy, right? I think you, when you work on an agency team, when you have a client who you love, there's a real intimacy there. There's an ability to really share all of the different things that um, are on your mind or all the different experiences that you've had in a really intimate and vulnerable way that helps you come up with great ideas. Um, Aurora and I weren't able to do that. Uh, eight years ago. There's an ability to be open um, and feel that anything that you say is going to be accepted and um, not just accepted, but that the other person is going to be curious about it and want you to share more about it. Um, there's, you know, the ability to bring your lived experience, right? Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that I've always loved about um, working in advertising throughout my career and working, you know, with different customers in different um, industries and environments is that um, somehow or another, I'm able to find some piece of my experience that um, relates to every single product or service I've ever worked on. Again, you know, Aurora had real experiences with the healthcare environment um, that we didn't we didn't hear about because she didn't feel that they were going to be um, acceptable in in the environment that we were in. So then, the other piece of me sharing my lived experience is being to see being able to see beyond my own lived experience, right? And I think. Um, this is a place where typically the experience that we are talking about when we're on an agency team, when we're in um, any kind of corporate environment, I'm not just picking on um, marketing and consulting and agency life, but typically the experience is the experience of being white. You know, when Aurora comes into AstraZeneca and kind of has to contort herself, and you saw that picture of her in the suit with the straightened hair, <laughs> um, she's essentially, you know, whitewashing herself and her experience and we're creating a team that's pretty homogenous. Um, we know that homogenous teams actually don't come up with new ideas well because they validate one another and they don't challenge one another. Um, and in order for us to see beyond what's to see beyond what we think is possible now and to really reimagine um, something beyond what we've experienced, we have to have the benefit of hearing about experiences from other people who see things and, and have perspectives and points of views that are different from our own and challenge the things that we believe. And so, you know, when Aurora and I think about culture, when we think about um, this notion of inclusivity, and I'm putting it in air quotes for those who can see me, because we'll talk about that more in a second, that's what, you know, I see as the real tragedy um, of having teams that um, are primarily white, or even if they're not primarily white, um, they are thinking and acting and engaging in a way that centers white experience. Um, we're all missing out when we do that. So we've talked about this a couple times. So I think we want to spend a little bit of time talking about this notion of inclusive. 
Um, because I think when we talk about including, it kind of means that there's already a space that's been created and we're just inviting others to come into it, right? It basically says whiteness is at the center and we're gonna include others into our white space. We're still gonna kind of keep this center, this, this moment of whiteness um, versus kind of getting rid of that circle altogether. Um, we're just inviting other people to be included into something that we've already created. This is a definition um, of inclusivity and there's an asterisk there because I think Aurora and I actually feel that even the term itself um, is ready to be revisited. We're not quite there yet. Um, if any of the brilliant minds on this call have thoughts that you wanna you know, share with us or follow up with us, we're, we're anxious to figure out what's the, what's the future. You know, a lot of the language that we use when we have these conversations, um, we feel is ready for an upgrade. But for now, we'll, we'll use inclusivity. And this is a definition that um, was actually in an article from Harvard Business Business review. Um, and, you know, Aurora and I, as, as marketers, as consultants, we do this type of work with our clients all the time to help them kind of reimagine the way that they message to the world. And so we, we kind of um, had a fun exercise of doing that with this notion of inclusivity. Um, I hope for those on this call who live in the world of messaging and narrative and content, you can kind of see the subtle but not so subtle differences um, that changing some words can make. Because if you look at the original definition, true inclusivity is the creation of an environment that recognizes the value that differences bring, allows those differences to be expressed, demonstrates courage and will, leverages those differences. It really is still talking about a center of power, which is most likely white power. I shouldn't say most likely, it is white power that's then almost you know, it's almost like it's got the puppet strings where it's leveraging all of these other um, different realities and people for its benefit. And so, and, am I, and I'm going to actually interject because as a brand client that spent 25 years leading brand teams and working with literally every major agency partner out there, here's what I had to decide. Every time that I got a new set of copy, I would have to decide, okay, today, do I have the energy to fight for the, the evolution of each of these words? And is the team I'm working with have the ability to see what I see? Despite the fact that in most brand teams that I actually created, I normally walked into, if I inherited a team, I normally walked into a white team that I very quickly evolved into a more diverse team. And I was the brand leader that got sent to the principal's office, AKA the CEO's office, most of my career, because I was the one that would call the head of agency and say, hey, I love all of the people on my account team, really smart people but not reflective of the diverse marketplace in which we live in. And can we take some time to consciously look at how we evolve our account team so that it is representative of the marketplace that we have been entrusted to serve and whose voice it is our obligation to ensure is a part of our creation. And number three, can I also ask that the suppliers, AKA the photographers, the, uh, the directors, the, the, the partners that you choose to bring into the creative process that we will co-create together, can we ask that they also have a broader and more holistic view in which they view human beings? Because then I'm going to spend a week convincing you that the photo shot that you given me, the models for the photo shoot that we're gonna do in two weeks, I guarantee you is not going to be reflective. And then we're gonna lose another two weeks while I have to go and have those conversations with my executive team because your executive management called my executive management and said that I'm delaying and I'm creating more problems than is worth. And we've got to get this brand launched. 
And so all of that that's happening on the back end, none of that was visible to Pamela because every example I just shared with you is exactly what happened when Pamela and I were working together over 10 years ago. Yep. I'll just briefly touch on the second paragraph here. I think a lot of times when we talk about, um, I'll just use the term DEI for now, we talk about goals versus mandates. You know, I think we believe, and we won't have time to get into that with you today, but we really believe that solving this, this, this culture issue should be considered a condition of excellence. Um, for organizations, and so it should be a mandate and not a goal. Um, and then second, this notion, and again, going back to this this idea of the, the including someone in the white center, um, it's about centering and not integrating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what could, if we had lived in a world like this, um, I've often asked myself, what could $5.83 billion actually have been? Um, because again, we fully believe, and I think more and more organizations are recognizing that this isn't about soft skills. This isn't just about, um, you know, treating each other well. Um, it is about those things, and it's about impacting the bottom line, period. So we just wanted to touch on some of the things that I think both of us have seen over the years. Um, I've certainly seen this living in agency world um, over the course of my career. Some of the ways that DNI gets incorporated um, in agencies. Um, frequently, there's some tokenism. We're working with a client right now um, who is squarely in this space where I think they there's an awareness, which isn't a bad thing. There's an awareness that we want to show diversity, um, but you know, how is that diversity, how is that awareness actually translating into the work, right? Just sort of making sure there's a black person in the ad or making sure we translate our ad into Spanish, especially if it's a group of white people who are working on that work and doing those translations um, isn't really, isn't enough. It's not um, authentic and it's not, um, I think, where we should challenge ourselves to go um, in 2020. Um, a lot of times it's white people making assumptions. Um, and sometimes it's assumptions paired with number three, which is yes, there's been focus groups and surveys, but again, this is sort of secondhand research that then sort of needs to be filtered through the lens of a white person reading um, a research piece or looking at qual or quant and then kind of dissecting, dissecting it themselves and putting it through a white person lens. And I think the result of that is that a lot of times it becomes more of a philosophical exercise um, um, it's not a heart-centered exercise where, again, you know, a person who looks like Aurora is saying, yes, here's the data, but let me tell you what that actually feels like. Um, and it simply becomes a box, that's, a box that's been checked. And so, you know, we've been able to take, uh, as Pamela articulated, the tapestry of our lived experiences our lived experiences as, as brand leaders um, that created a tremendous amount of impact for the organizations that we were privileged to be a part of and sort of look at, you know, what do we believe um, as an organization? Well, we believe that society in the marketplace that um, limits the fullest potential of individuals really is going to lack the creation of products of marketplaces, of consumers, and quite frankly, a society where everyone thrives. I think secondarily, and we've talked about this a little bit, and this is where my <clears throat> my roots as a copywriter um, and a storyteller come come to light. But um, I think we're we're suffering from a lack of these stories and narratives and this beautiful mosaic. Um, of things that we are not, um, we're not bringing to the forefront. And I think we all suffer and miss out when we don't get to um, hear narratives that um, aren't just our own and aren't just the narratives that are familiar to me because they're the narratives of people who look like me and have lived similar experiences to me. And, you know, we know and you all know because you're at the forefront of your organizations of what you do as a, as a collective agency group is that change is given. Um, but I will also offer that there was something that dramatically happened over 18 weeks ago when we all became much more conscious of the fact that we are part of a um, human community. And that we became much more aware, and I'm going to be specific, I believe white people became much more aware 
through the horrendous um, deaths of Aubrey and George Floyd, um, that we have to evolve and that we have to incorporate that in the way that we change and that the time to do that is not now, it's right now. Yeah. And that creating that change is really going to challenge all of us to have an unprecedented level of openness to that evolution. And last but not least, and it may, it's it's a it's something that we've been um, saying, but I want to say we want to say it out loud in words is that the voices, perspectives, and experience of Black and Indigenous people, people of color, must be galvanized to forge the world we want to live in. Um, I'm just going to briefly go back to you know what I talked about in the evolution of my relationship with Aurora. Um, you know, I feel. Um, I feel sorry for the me of 10 years ago who only knew kind of a sliver of who she really is as a human and how much it has enriched me and my work um, to, to know, you know, hopefully closer to uh, 90 or 100 percent of who she is now. And that's my wish for um, every white person in this this country um, is to really know the people who are our brothers and sisters in a way that I, I know we don't today. So we just, yeah. So we just want to say thank you so much. Um, we hope that you know some of what we had to share um, was um, helpful, provocative, interesting. These are conversations that um, Aurora and I, and certainly Aurora even more than I, um, have um, on a regular basis, and we're we're truly um, honored to have been able to share a little bit of this thinking with you today.